If you recently embarked on bioidentical HRT or just standard HRT full of hope and expectation that it was going to resolve all of those unwanted perimenopause or menopause symptoms, sudden unexplained weight gain without changing anything else, a total lack of libido or feeling of connection with your partner and yourself, inability to sleep, inability to focus, anxiety, depression, mood swings, and a lack of energy. And instead of actually resolving those symptoms, you might have felt better for a little bit and then those symptoms got dramatically worse. In fact, I spoke with a client only yesterday who reported that she'd put on 22 pounds of weight in four weeks when she went on to HRT. Well, this video is for you. And it's probably going to be the first and only time that it's ever been thoroughly explained as to what is happening. And we can do this with some authority because in the last decade of helping females apply bioidentical HRT successfully to resolve their symptoms and improve their lives, we have observed six key pitfalls that happen in the process of applying bioidentical HRT. So if you've experienced all of these symptoms after applying HRT, it's not your fault. It's not that HRT doesn't work for you. It's simply that the process has not been correctly managed for you. And that's not your responsibility. Let me just introduce myself. My name is Rowan Sanderson. I am the founder of the Hormone Balance Clinic. And I'm really proud to present this to you because our primary mission is to be of service and to help guide people through the HRT labyrinth, all of which is really possible. We are huge fans of bioidentical HRT. In fact, I would just move the game on and say, these aren't sex hormones. They are so much more. Sure, their primary function is sex hormones, but get this right, and these are longevity compounds which will contribute to vibrancy, health, good cholesterol management, a denser bone matrix. So. Let's jump in. Number one reason that the traditional way we apply HRT is not working, and that is simply that most people, most practitioners, are assuming that perimenopause and menopause are the same. I like to think of this as two sea states. One is a very stormy sea at high tide, one is a very calm sea at low tide where little is changing. Perimenopause, menopause, they couldn't be more different. So of course it makes zero sense that a one size fits all solution for menopause can be applied to perimenopause. It's frankly crackers. Let's look at this. If this is levels and this is time, Oestrogen and progesterone, that I like to look at this as the two stalks theory. Why? Stalks actually mate for life, they fly together, and they're dependent on each other for their survival and procreation. They always fly at a similar level. They fly together in tandem at slightly different levels throughout your cycle, crossing over as they are flying. When we get to perimenopause, what happens is the progesterone stalk actually flies much lower, much sooner than the oestrogen stalk. And oestrogen continues much like this. But this creates what we could call an altitude gap. And this is temporary oestrogen dominance. Now, if you go to your traditional practitioner, and they go through this thought process of, ah, she's female. Ah, menopause, I've read about that. I'm just going to give her estrogen and progesterone and some testosterone. Well, that estrogen dominance only gets worse. So all of these symptoms like weight gain and mood swings, and sometimes as I hear quite often, I felt glued to the sofa. And even one client told me last week is, 
I felt like my boobs were bigger than when I'd had my breast operation. All of these things get worse because you've just been given more estrogen when you're in estrogen dominance. Sure, you've got a little bit extra progesterone, but this altitude gap is the same. Now, as you progress into menopause, estrogen and progesterone actually join each other again because you're producing very little, if any, of either of these hormones. So that traditional one-size-fits-all approach can be more applicable, but you can see how drastically misused it is in this situation. Let's just conclude, and I will show you how to remedy this, that perimenopause and menopause might have the same word in it, menopause, but couldn't be more different and need a different approach, a lot more strategic and refined. Let's jump into part two. Testing, without doubt, the most important part of this whole conversation. You cannot guess, you have to test. Now, there are people who are up there who are saying, well, actually, it's quite easy to work out where you are because if you've got this, this, and this symptom, wait a minute. Nearly all of the symptoms of estrogen excess and estrogen dominance are the same as a lack of estrogen with a couple of outlying exceptions. Vaginal dryness, thinning skin, that's generally a lack of estrogen. But even then, that's not telling you how your body is breaking down those estrogens, which is a key part of empowering yourself for the next 50 years of health. This is 2025. We have this technology available. It's affordable. You can do it at home. So testing is essential before you make any decisions. You can't possibly give someone directions if you don't know where they're standing. So we use the Dutch test, which stands for dried urines for total comprehensive hormones. It's actually way more accurate than a blood test, way more insightful than a blood test, and it's a lot less invasive as you can do it at home. Okay, so the next part, is numbers three and four, inflammation and stress. I've put these together because they actually go hand in hand. Now, based on several million tests over the last decade, it has been identified that the two biggest influences on your hormones are inflammation and stress. So for anybody to try and approach optimizing your hormones or supporting you in bioidentical HRT, without managing these, well, it's just simply doomed to failure. If we look at what happens, let's just take, for example, estrogen dominance. So this would be your estrogen and this is your progesterone. Stress can, in several ways, raise estrogen. And this is gonna tie into part five, testosterone. So please bookmark this mentally. Estrogen dominance can be made worse by inflammation. So simply supplementing your hormones to actually regulate estrogen dominance is not going to work unless we also address inflammation. And the next part is stress. Now stress can make estrogen dominance worse. Why? Well, stress and specifically cortisol can suppress progesterone. And a classic example of this is females who suddenly arrive in perimenopause, maybe go on to bioidentical HRT, suddenly realize they've put on 15, 20, 25 pounds. And this is a story we hear day in, day out in this clinic when we're helping people. And they suddenly assume they've done something wrong, which they haven't. And their best solution is to do more of what used to work in the past. So that includes things like high intensity interval training, excess cardio, 
more weights, fasting, cold plunging, and various other of these tools, which actually spike cortisol and suppress pro progesterone, make this estrogen dominance worse whilst contributing to fatigue and inability to sleep. And they become super frustrated and dejected that they've not turned the dial on weight loss. I'm going to come back to how to resolve this very shortly, so please bear with me. You can see, therefore, that just looking at inflammation and stress, that both of these can contribute to estrogen dominance, and both of them can contribute to hormonal imbalance. Without actually addressing these, weight loss will be impossible. So let's bear this in mind and we'll go to the next part. Thank you for staying with me. This information is really here to serve you. And once you have these key parts in mind, it's going to empower you to truly make some informed decisions around your hormones, which I am hoping and is my intent is going to serve you for the next 50 years of life. Now, we're coming to part five. Part five is testosterone. And this is also a key part in the chain of misadventures leading to HRT failure. There seems to be a lack of comprehension in the current approach that testosterone can, in fact, become estrogen. So let's go back to this scenario we were talking about here. You have some temporary estrogen dominance where this is estrogen and this is progesterone, okay? You have a bit of inflammation, perhaps. So your estrogen level is now here. Let's move that. And you've suddenly been hitting the gym hard, starving yourself, your sleep's disrupted, and you're doing some intermittent fasting. So this has raised your cortisol and suppressed progesterone. So your new progesterone level is here. And you can see that what was here is now here. You have a much more pronounced estrogen dominance and with that, a greater level of fatigue. So you go to your primary care practitioner who says, I know what's missing, testosterone. Just put in some testosterone, that'll make you feel great. You'll find your libido. You're full of hope understandably, because finally somebody is giving you a solution to this miserable whirlpool of symptoms. So you throw in testosterone. Unfortunately, because of all this inflammation and stress, it activates the pathway called CYP19, which is aromatization. So most of that testosterone is now converted into estrogen and the problem just gets worse. I have lost count of the number of calls I've taken in the last month alone, where people have said to me, wow, my doctor finally agreed to give me some testosterone. I took it and for about eight days I felt great. My libido came back. Me and my partner enjoyed some intimacy. I thought this is finally it. And then suddenly, without changing a single thing, I put on 10 pounds. This is why. And you think, well, hang on. How can I possibly get the benefits of testosterone? I'm about to explain all of this in a blow by blow how to blueprint for you. So you can see very clearly that all of these things combined means that HRT is much less likely to work for you than to work for you unless you're addressing it. Frankly, it's becoming a lottery of health. And I can't think of any other area of healthcare where people would succeed in 10% of cases and yet it would continue. Can you imagine an operation where 
90% of the people died and they continued doing it, there would be uproar. So my question to you is, how is this acceptable? It's 2025. Let's do something about it. But before we do that, I'm going to cover the final point, which is number six. And this for me is beautiful, is support. Everybody, you are all unique. Sure, there are trends, there are patterns, there are predispositions, but everybody is unique and everybody has a different hormonal metabolism. And we can see that from the Dutch test. I've read over a thousand of these in the last decade. I've never seen one exactly the same. So how can you be expected to actually <laughs> apply HRT when everybody reacts differently? Support is critical to this. So we've talked about the reasons why it failed. Let's just recap. One, it's assuming that perimenopause equals menopause. The only thing in common between perimenopause and menopause is the word menopause. Yes, they're part of the same timeline. They couldn't be more separate and distinct. Come back to the sea state analogy. Stormy sea at high tide, calm sea at low tide. Perimenopause, menopause. Sure, it's the sea. It's a different time. It's a different state. Two, testing. For me, the number one. Without finding out where you are on your hormone health journey, how can you possibly expect to have direction? Three, inflammation, a critical player. Four, stress, also a critical player and a key influencer of your hormones. Five, testosterone. Testosterone can become estrogen through the CYP19 pathway. We need to understand that and we need to be able to modulate that. Six, support. Without each of these keystones in place, bioHRT is very unlikely to succeed. The people who do succeed are outliers. And think about it. Look around at the amount of friends you have who have started bioidentical HRT. How many of them have not put on weight? How many of them have said they feel dramatically better. I am willing to bet that between eight and nine out of 10 of them are actually saying, I feel a bit better, but I, it's better than how I felt before. And I can't go back to how I felt before. We're basically saying it's the lesser of two evils. And frankly, that's not good enough. You deserve better.